Hans Wildorf was an innovative visionary who established Rolex in 1905. He was renowned for his relentless pursuit of precision and reliability within watchmaking. And the invention of the practical automatic movement was a crucial juncture in the 20th century watchmaking. However, it was not until 1931 that Wilsdorf introduced Rolex's first automatic wristwatch, the Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Rolex was dedicated to producing high quality and reliable wristwatches. The introduction of the self-winding Oyster Perpetual in 1931 was a significant milestone in the history of Rolex and- Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out, time out. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What? Google, when did Rolex start making in-house movements? It may come as a surprise to some, but it was only in 2004 when Rolex outright purchased the movement manufacturing facility that makes the calibers for Rolex watches. It is no doubt that the Borer Anglier Movement Manufacturing Company had a strong bond with Hans Wildorf. After all, Rolex was one of their biggest customers next to Gruen. Nevertheless, I think it's clearly an exercise in stretching the facts to claim that the movement in the 1931 Rolex Oyster Perpetual was in fact Rolex's movement. Hmm, or is it? It's not that clear cut. Let's also not forget the little detail about its claim to be the first automatic movement also. Let's unpack this part of the story a little later. For now, let's rewind the clock and see how John Harwood's journey began. John Harwood was born in 1893 in Bolton, Lancashire, England. During World War I, he served as an armory staff surgeon in the British Army. Left unsatisfied by the military-issued wristwatch, Harwood was motivated by his experiences with faulty military hardware to develop the first practical automatic movement for wristwatches. In 1923, he patented his self-winding automatic design and would go on to introduce the Harwood Perpetual at the Basel Fair in the city of Basel, Switzerland in, that's right, 1926. No doubt, Hans Wildorf and every other leader in the industry was there to witness Harwood's achievement. The establishment of Harwood's watch company was well received by the public as his renowned automatic wristwatches were sold and manufactured locally. Harwood had persuaded Walter Volk, Swiss watchmaker of Fortis, to manufacture his design. In the era of Art Deco, bold geometric shapes and strong color contrasts characterized decorative arts, where the Harwood automatic watch was designed and produced in the 1920s and 30s. A distinctive Harwood automatic watch features an elegant round case and ornate bezel, sharp angular lugs, and a minimal unadorned dial with large stylized Arabic numerals. Dials with contrasting hues of black on white or cream would often be engraved with decorative guillaché patterns. You will also notice a small circular window above the six hour position with a red marker behind. That would indicate whether the movement was locked and running or was open to adjust the time with the ingeniously designed bi-directional bezel. Harwood casings, often made of solid silver, would feature a simple snap-on case back. The initial competition and feud between Harwood and Wilsdorf emulated the advancing technology of automatic movements. The innovative acclaim of the first practical automatic movement was primarily accredited to Hans Wilsdorf instead of John Harwood. Wilsdorf never actually apologized for taking credit for Harwood's innovation. He only apologized for hurting his feelings, rather than openly recognizing his innovation with the development of practical automatic movements, which Rolex highlights the obvious importance of recognizing the work of all innovators in the field of horology. In 1956, an agreement was reached. Some 30 years later, Rolex changed its advertisement. A portrait of John Harwood was included in the Rolex advertisements, and a sincere apology by Rolex gave John Harwood full credit as the inventor of the world's first automatic wristwatch. Harwood's design, the first practical automatic movement, comprised of a center fixed rotor. Through kinetic force, the rotor would swing back and forth 180 degrees, bouncing off a pair of pistons on opposite sides, allowing the mainspring to be wound while the watch was worn. The elimination of manual winding made wristwatches increasingly reliable 
accurate, and functional. The officialization of Harwood's patents by Fortis paved the way for the development of automatic movements by numerous other watchmakers in the following years. The legacy of Harwood's automatic movement quickly became a standard attribute of high-quality watchmaking with companies such as Omega, Tissot, and Jaeger Le Couture employing the bumper-style automatic movement until the mid-1960s and continue to capture the hearts of many watch collectors today. In contrast to Harwood's bumper movement, Rolex, or is it Angliar? Which one developed the first automatic movement with a full-turn rotor? Well, the patent was created in Angliar's name in 1931, and the inventor was Emile Borer, who started his career in the family business as an engineer in Biel, Switzerland. Also, in 1931, Borer was appointed as a director of Angliar SA and subsequently the chief technical director also. Here's where the claim starts to get a bit interesting. Business between Rolex and Angliar had flourished until the Great Depression in 1929. Many businesses suffered and Rolex was not spared. Herman Angliar invested in the survival of his largest customer by acquiring 6,960 shares of Montres Rolex SA and was appointed to the board. It is said that he was given these shares and that there must have been a deal on the table as business recovered both Rolex and Grun became large shareholders of Angliar. And that's the moment right there that defines things for me. Soon after, the Angliar company adopted the trading name Angliar SA Fabriques des Montres, Rolex and Grun Guild A. At this point, Angliar was making movements for Rolex and Grun with distribution rights set for each company. In 1936, Grun ceased purchasing watches from Angliar in September. Angliar SA changed its corporate name, dropping the reference to Grun and styling itself as Manufacturer des Montres Rolex Angliar SA, although it was now wholly owned again by the Angliar family. Montres Rolex SA, Geneve, agreed to take up the entire production of the Angliar factory in Bienne. In my opinion, I'm going to let Rolex have it. They can call Emile Barrer their chief technical director because of the webs of entanglement between the companies regarding the bailout and the share buybacks. They were clearly looking after each other's interests 100% of the way. And one could not exist without the other. It seems it's just a bit of semantics and splitting hairs at this point. But they cannot and did not keep the claim of the first automatic wristwatch movement. In contrast to Harwood's bumper movement, it can be said, at least by me, that Rolex developed the first automatic movement with a full turning rotor. It was a considerable innovation within automatic watchmaking, allowing the rotor to turn 360 degrees, providing greater efficiency in winding the mainspring. The full turn rotor was increasingly more efficient than the prior bumper movement. However, the invention of the bumper movement with absolutely no doubt establishes John Harwood as a giant shoulder to stand on, indeed a pioneer in the history of watchmaking. That's all I have for you on this one. Ola M out.